All right, I wonder, and I can kind of tell by looking out across the congregation, but I have a simple question for you, and you can answer with a raise of your hand, okay? I wonder, how many of you are morning people? You say, I love the morning, I look forward to the morning, I'm ready to go, I'm raring to go, I love the morning. You're liking the 10 a.m. service time, which you're like, yeah, forget 10 a.m., let's make it 8 a.m., let's make it 6 a.m., you know? Uh, okay, okay, so we are continuing this 10 a.m. service time throughout the summer, and one thing I've discovered is that uh, there are some people in our church who are not morning people, and 10 a.m. has been tough, but it's been a special test of your faith, and I think you've grown closer to Christ because of it, so on behalf of the leadership team, you're welcome. You might be a morning person if some of these things are true about you, so... If you're a morning person, I want you to keep your hand raised, okay? And we do that, I've got like three or four of you. And then put it down if one of these statements is not true of you, okay? You wake up easily in the morning. You feel most alert, productive, and active in the early morning. You go to bed by 9 or 10 p.m. and generally get enough sleep. You rarely set an alarm, and if you do, you never press the snooze button. That one is not true of me. I always set an alarm, and I always, Connie will tell you, press the snooze button. This morning, I actually woke up before my alarm and reset my alarm to sleep a little bit longer. Maybe you feel like your day is wasted if you stay in bed past 9 a.m. or 10 a.m. Morning people feel that way. Finally, if you're a morning person, you might know the words to this little song by Rogers and Hammerstein. I used to wake up to it when, with my mom, who was a morning person, when I would groggily come out of bed and go to the kitchen. She would sometimes greet us and say, there's a bright golden haze on the meadow. You know that one? There's a bright golden haze on the meadow. The corn is as high as an elephant's eye. Sharon knows it. And it looks like it's climbing clear up to the sky. Oh, come on, help me out here. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. Oh, what a beautiful feeling. Everything's going my way. Hey. Oh, what a beautiful day. All right, so based on my singing of the song and you're not joining with me, I don't think we have that many morning people here with us today. Last Sunday in Psalm 4, we discussed the prayers that we often offer on sleepless nights. Psalm 4 is a psalm written for those tossing and turning in their beds. And you might remember Psalm 4 concluded in verse 8 saying, in peace I will both lie down and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Today in Psalm 5, we turn to a morning psalm, though it's not really a Rogers and Hammerstein musical. It's not really a, oh, what a beautiful morning, oh, what a beautiful day kind of psalm. In fact, Derek Kidner calls Psalm 5 a clouded dawn, a clouded dawn. For the shadows of enemy and the menace of hurtful words lurk throughout the psalm, but it's a psalm for the morning. It's the kind of morning where you wake up and maybe you're not so full of uh, happy expectation for the day. It's the kind of morning where you wake up and you say, Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Now, every morning we wake up with that kind of expectation. But some mornings, boy, we know there's a day ahead of us. And so in Psalm 5, verse 3, the psalmist David prays, O oh Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you, and I watch. We'll talk more about that verse in just a moment. But this is a psalm for the morning. And whether you're a morning person or not, as we get into Psalm 5, we're going to see that we can learn several things about seeking God in our waking hours when false gossip when hurtful accusations swirl around us, you might not be a morning person, but guess what? We all ought to be morning disciples. Morning disciples of Jesus. So let's consider a few characteristics of morning disciples and the prayers of morning disciples. Are we ready? Mark, are you ready back there? 
Here we go. Psalm 5 and verse 1. To the choir master for the flutes, a psalm of David. It's written to the choir master or the music director, meaning that this personal prayer of David was put into writing and given to the director of music for all the people to sing. And so, once again, it's the vulnerability and honesty of King David put out there for his people to say, just as I, your king, have experienced God's faithfulness to my life in difficulty, and just as I, your king, have learned how to express that difficulty to the Lord in prayer, so here is an example for you to follow. And so it's a really beautiful thing to come to these psalms, personal in nature, and yet public by design for us to pray and sing together. So first of all, what do we see about morning disciples? Number one, and this is probably the main point of our psalm today, morning disciples seek an audience with the one true God. Now, if you have your bulletin, there's blanks in the back. Some of you are starting to fill in those blanks, and that's a good thing that you can do to Follow along and also have some notes that you can look up later. It's good to have your Bible open and check that what I am saying is in a line in accordance with what the Word of God says. Morning disciples seek an audience with the one true God. Verse 1, give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning. Give attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God. For to you do I pray. Look down at verse 7. But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I will bow down towards your holy temple in the fear of you. Now what I want you to see here in this address and the way that David the psalmist addresses God. First of all, some of the titles that he uses. I look closely at verse 1. What's the first title that he uses for God? You might skip over it if you don't look closely because it's rather common. Oh, oh Lord. Oh, exactly, Lord. Debbie. You got it. <laughs> oh, Lord. And Lord is in all caps, meaning this is the name Yahweh, the covenant name that God entrusted to his people, given to Moses at the burning bush. This is a special entrustment of God to his people, Yahweh. I am who I am, I will be who I will be. When we address the Lord as Yahweh, we are addressing him as a God who is present with us. Through every season, through every circumstance, through every trial, through every happiness, he is with us, and he's promised his people, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Give ear to my words, O Lord, O covenant God. He also addresses him in verse 2. What's another way he addresses him? King and my God. King and my God. My king and my God. So David, the greatest king of Israel, addresses the Lord as my king. King with a capital K. And my God. So he is the one true God. He is the one true king. And then if you look at the petitions, he says, Give ear, and he says, give attention, give ear to my words, give attention to the sound of my cry. So this isn't one of those peaceful mornings of uh, waking up and, oh, what a beautiful morning, and you make your coffee, and you've got your Danish, and you're sitting there just looking forward to, oh, what are we going to do today? Well, I think I'll start out with a brisk walk, and then I think maybe after that I'll uh, prepare myself a nice breakfast and no, this is one of those days where David's waking up and he's got on his mind the accusations, the lies, the words of his opponents and those who mean him harm. Like we talked about last week, sometimes as we are trying to go to sleep at night, we have the echoes of accusation that are bouncing around in our heads and we're replaying those conversations. And, and he's waking up in the morning realizing that those conversations and echoes of accusation were not just imagination, but they are reality. And so now he's got to deal with this. And the first thing he does to deal with it is not to hit the snooze button, go back to sleep and pretend it doesn't exist. The first thing he does to deal with the problems in his life is what? Pray. To pray. 
to bring it to the Lord first thing in the morning. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning. Give attention to the sound of my cry, my God, my King. For to you do I pray. If you're the kind of person that writes in your Bible, and that's the kind of person I am, I like to write in my Bible. I, I let David borrow my Bible a minute ago for the scripture reading, and I, I forgot that there's so many notes and circles and squares and things in my Bible. It's probably kind of hard to read, but you did a great job. I've seen past all of that. That was excellent. Uh, if you're the kind of person that circles things, uh, circle that little uh, prepositional phrase, to you. To you. It's the, the direction, to you do I pray. You say, well, that's nothing extraordinary about that. Well, really, there is. There is. To whom do we pray? To whom do we look? To whom are we, do we seek help from? To you. Oh God, do I pray to you? Are we really praying to God? That's why it's so important to have a vital, private prayer life. For our prayer life, and this could be a struggle for pastors, our prayer life ought to be in keeping with what's called the iceberg principle. Are you familiar with that? Icebergs uh, float around in the, the cold seas, of course. We know about the Titanic. We know about some things like that. But icebergs, a little bit of that sticks up above the water, maybe like 5 to 10 percent. But most of the iceberg is beneath the surface, under the water. And so when it comes to prayer, especially for those of us that are in church, especially for pastors where we're doing a lot of public praying, yes, we're going to have that visible public prayer life that people see, but most of our time with God needs to be in the quiet place, underneath the surface. And that's what keeps us balanced. That's what keeps us going, just like an iceberg. And so we call it the iceberg principle of prayer. So we should have that private prayer life with the Lord. To you do I pray. One pastor was sharing that he had been in dozens of prayer meetings. <laughs> And he had experienced uh, what he called teaching prayers or direction prayers, in which the person praying didn't really seem to be praying to God, but seemed to be praying with the hopes that somebody else was listening to the prayer. Have you ever heard a prayer like that before? Maybe you've offered a prayer like that where, where you were hoping that the person praying next to you was listening to your prayer and you weren't talking to God so much as to them. Another thing is that's kind of at this very basic level is we don't pray to other gods. We don't pray to the saints. We don't ask St. Thomas for help with this. What is that? What is he supposed to do? Help us sell our house or something? We don't ask another saint for to help us uh, find something we've lost. St. Jude, I think, is the one some people pray. St. Anthony. Anthony, something yeah. like that. Um, so maybe you grew up in a tradition where you pray to different saints to help you with different problems in your life. And we don't do that. We pray to God. We pray to the Lord. There's one mediator between us and God, and that mediator is Jesus Christ. And so in his name, we can go directly to the very throne room of God, and we address him in prayer. So to you do I pray. It's so important that our prayers are directed to God. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. We're praying to God. And I think it's important that we also think through what that really means. The God and creator of the universe is inviting you into his presence in prayer to present your requests and your petitions before him. Do we deserve an audience with the one true king and God of the universe? Is that something that we deserve by personal rights? Because of, no, we don't. We don't deserve that at all. We're sinners. We deserve separation from God for now and forever. Well, look at what verse 7 says. But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. 
through the multitude of mercy, the King James says, through the multitude of mercy will enter your house. Mercy or love or loving kindness there is the Hebrew word chesed, which means the covenant, loyal, loving, mercy, faithfulness of God to his people. Through his chesed, we are able to enter this house and bow down towards his holy temple in the fear of you, in the reverence of you, recognizing you for, for who you are, and reverencing you in holy fear. And so in this regard, I really appreciate the imagery of the tabernacle from the Old Testament. Are you familiar with the imagery of the tabernacle in the Old Testament? So first of all, you've, you've got to be in the right place with the right people. All right, so you're with the congregation of Israel. You're with the right people in the right place. You're in the right group. Second of all, then, you would pass through the gate. The tabernacle was surrounded uh, by fencing of a curtain sort. You would pass through the one gate, the one entrance, and that clearly is symbolic of how Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And we enter into God's presence only through Jesus. Jesus said, no one comes to the Father except through me. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so we're entering into the presence of God through Jesus. We then pass through the outer courts by the altar of burnt offering, the bronze laver for washing, and we recognize that Jesus is the final offering for our sins. We have no right to dare to enter into the, the holy place, let alone the holy of holies where the very presence of God resides. And yet we pass right by the altar of burnt offering because Jesus is the final offering for sins. He said, it is finished, it is paid in full. We pass by the, the, uh, the place of washing, the laver of washing, realizing that we have been washed by the Holy Spirit. Our sins have been washed away. We've been redeemed, not by anything that we have done, but only by the mercies, the chesed, the grace of God. We pass through the outer courts. We pass into the sanctuary, into the holy place. Now, wait a minute. We're not Israelites by birth. We're not Levites who are tasked by God to serve in the tabernacle ministry. We're certainly not priests in the line of Aaron. What gives us the right? What gives us the right to enter into the holy place? We go past the table of showbread. We go past the candlestick menorah, the altar of incense to the very veil itself. All of these things are pictures of Jesus and, and what he has done for us to grant us access to the very presence of the one true God. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the light of the world. Our prayers like incense in Jesus' name by the power of the Holy Spirit rise before God. And what happened to that holy veil, not in the tabernacle, but in the temple in Jerusalem, when Jesus died upon the cross? That veil, so tall, so thick, was torn in two, not from the bottom up by a human hand, but it was torn in two from the top down by the very hand of God. Why? Because Jesus is granting access to all who believe into the very holy presence of God. Now only the high priest, and that only once a year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, was allowed to enter into the Holy of Holies. And there to approach in the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, the wings of the cherubim, were the Shekinah, visible glory of God could be seen and there to offer blood atonement for the sins of God's people. 
And yet you and I have the incredible blessing through Jesus to enter not only into the outer courts, not only into the holy place, but through the veil into the holy of holies and there to make our requests and petitions known before God. And we have that blessing, that access, not one day a year, but every single moment of every single day. Pray without ceasing, the scripture says. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our times of need. Christ's death upon the cross tore the veil. Christ opened the way. Christ himself is the way, the truth, and the life. Mourning disciples seek an audience with the one true God. Through faith in Jesus, they are granted access every single time. All right, as we continue through Psalm 5, we'll go a little quicker now, but I want to point out to you three more truths about mourning disciples and their prayer life. Second of all, mourning disciples lay their requests before God and wait in faith-filled expectation for God to act. Mourning disciples lay their requests before God and wait in expectation for God to act. Take a look at verse 3. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. Now that's one way to translate verse 3, but if you have the ESV, you'll see a note there that can also be translated. In the morning I direct my prayer to you and watch. I like how the NIV translates uh, this verse, it says, In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you, and I wait in expectation. That's the idea of watching. It's a sense of expectancy, waiting in expectation for God to act, for God to respond to our prayers. I wonder, when you pray... Do you, first of all, pray, that's a beautiful thing, but do you wait expectantly for God to respond? Do you have faith to say, okay, God, I know you're able. I know you can do this, and I'm going to wait for your response. And faith believes that God can do it, and trust surrenders to God's will all the way through it. If God says, yes, I will do it, or God says, no, that's not what's best for you. You might not understand right now, but that's not how I'm going to answer your prayer. God says, wait. God can answer our prayers in many different ways, but do we wait in faith-filled expectation for God to act? The picture here is kind of like our little doggies, Bella and Pandy. Uh, I know I mentioned them a lot, but boy, Bella and Pandy... You know, once again this morning, Andy jumped up on the bed and woke me up with kisses, and I kind of threw her off and, you know, took care of them. 3 a.m., by the way, that's when she wakes me up this morning. 3 a.m. Did you wake up, Patty? Every morning. Every morning, 3 a.m. But I love little Bella and Candy. One thing I love about them, and if you've had a dog or a pet at home that does this, you can really appreciate it. When you're away from the house, they are waiting expectantly the entire time for you to get home. You could be gone for 12 hours, and they might be dozing or sleeping, but the slightest little noise of a key in the lock, or the slightest noise of the beep beep of the car outside, or even, even just the sound of the car pulling up in front of the house, they know what our car sounds like. And they are immediately at the window, jumping around, barking, tails wagging wide. They're waiting expectantly. They trust that we're coming home. They don't know exactly when, but they're waiting expectantly. I heard a pastor who's a grandparent telling the story of his grandchildren. And when they would go to visit them, the grandchildren would be so excited for grandma and grandpa to drive down the country road that they'd go in the front yard and climb up in the trees so that they could be the first one to see grandma and grandpa driving down the road. 
They're waiting expectantly for them to arrive. One more story here from church. Uh, a couple people somehow, I don't know how I agreed to this or why I agreed to this, but uh, I share Life 360 with them. And so they kind of know where I'm at. And so on Sundays when I'm walking from home to church in the evening, uh, there'll be a little, sometimes one person, but sometimes a whole crowd of people on the sidewalk waiting for me to walk down Melvina, and I don't know if they're waiting for me to get here or just for me to start the evening dinner. I'm not sure exactly, but it's it's fun to have people who are, like, looking out for you, right? Imagine how it must bless the heart of God. I think it blesses the heart of God as we wait expectantly for him, perhaps in a similar and yet much more serious way than those illustrations may proclaim to us. Now look at what verse 8 says. It says, Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness. Because of my enemies, make your way straight before me. So we're expecting God to lead us and to guide us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. We trust in the Lord with all of our heart and we lean not on our own understandings and all our ways we acknowledge him. And we believe that he will make our paths straight. He will direct our paths. Now, verse 8 introduces to us the idea of enemies. The idea of enemies. And one thing that surprises people when they study the Psalms, they think the Psalms are going to be all uh, praise ye the Lord and peace unto God's people. And then they get to the Psalms and they find out there's something called imprecation. Everybody say that word with me. Imprecation. Not information, but imprecation. And imprecatory psalms or psalms of imprecation are psalms where the psalmist is saying, Lord, I have enemies. Deal with them. <laughs> Take care of them. According to your justice, Lord, respond to the enemies in my life. And so that's what we see in verses 4 through 6 and verses 9 and 10. And what we learn about mourning disciples is that they agree with God about the seriousness of sin and the separation it brings. We agree with God about the seriousness of sin and the separation it brings. Some of you aren't comfortable with this. But I think it's an appropriate thing, just as prayers of lament are something that are appropriate, so also prayers of imprecation in this regard can be appropriate as well. You might think that we should pray something like this. Lord, I pray that you will overlook everyone's sin, and regardless of how they respond to your Savior Jesus, let all people go to heaven. Now, don't raise your hand, but I bet some of you will go, yeah, that sounds pretty good. Lord, overlook everybody's sin, and regardless of how they respond to Jesus, even if they reject them and spit upon him and hate him, let everybody go into heaven. And you might think, yeah, that's, that's a good Christian prayer. No, it's not. That prayer does not align with God's justice. That prayer does not agree with how serious God takes sin and how he has sent his one and only son to be the one and only way to be our Savior. So the prayers of imprecation in Scripture actually agree with God about the seriousness of sin. So look at verse 4. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. God does not wink at sin. And you're right, Brother Tom. He just said God's not wishy-washy when it comes to sin. You are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The consequences of sin, death, the wages of sin is death, separation from God forever and for always. Evil may not dwell with you. God is holy, 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 and our sin separates us from a holy God. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. And you say, wait a minute, wait a minute. You hate all evildoers? 
What about for God so loved the world? How does, how does that work out? Yes, God loved the world. Yes, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That is God's purpose and design, but we know that many will reject the salvation of Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. We would believe in him, we are not condemned. When we reject him, we are condemned already. And so as Christians, we agree with God in his holiness and justice and the seriousness of sin and the separation that it brings. And in this case, David is agreeing with God in his justice and crying out to God for justice against those who mean him harm. Look at verse 9. There is no truth in their mouth. So we see that the, the assault that David is experiencing is primarily verbal. False propaganda against him as king. There is no truth in their mouth. Their inmost self is destruction. Their throat is an open grave. Paul quotes from that as part of his litany of sin. And for all have sinned in Romans 3.13. Gentile and Jew alike. They flatter with their tongue. Make them bear their guilt, O God, lest let them fall by their own counsels. He's simply crying out to God to be just. He's praying in agreement with the will of God in justice towards sinful humanity. Because of the abundance of their transgressions, cast them out, for they have rebelled against you. How have they rebelled against the Lord? Because they rebelled against the Lord's anointed king. To reject the king and his leadership in this case is to reject the Lord as king and his choice of the king as leader. So we may be uncomfortable with these kinds of psalms of imprecation, but we must remember that they are simply cries for divine justice. And while our prayer must always be for our enemy to repent and to turn from their sins and receive forgiveness and redemption, we also agree with God about his justice. We know that God is patient and merciful, desiring every lost sinner to repent and be redeemed unto salvation. But we also must agree with God about his justice. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense to you. If it doesn't, I'd be happy to, to talk and pray with you more about it. One other thing about this, this is not only David's prayer, but it was written for all the people to read and to hear and to sing. And so in that sense, this prayer is also what we might call a severe mercy from God. It's a warning to those who are doing these kinds of things. If you keep doing these things, this is what's going to happen. If you continue in your sin and your refusal to humble yourself, to repent, and to avail yourself of the salvation offered through Jesus, this is what is going to happen to you. It's also a reminder that we must be humble, because what does David himself say? He says, I, through your steadfast love and mercy, will enter your house. You see, he recognizes that he, in and of himself, is a sinful man, unable to approach God, but only through God's merciful invitation can he approach the Lord in his house and bow down towards his holy temple in fear of the Lord. We might say it like this, there but by the grace and mercy of God go I. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved, say it, a wretch, a wretch like me. me. <clears throat> we can acknowledge I am a wretch and yet at the same time a child of the one true king. I am a sinner separated from God, but through Jesus I am a co-heir with Christ, granted full access to the very throne room of God in heaven. Incredible, the blessing that we have in Christ Jesus. Finally, a fourth thing that we learn about mourning disciples. Mourning disciples rejoice in the blanketing protection and covering shield of the Lord's salvation. Verse 11 says, but let all who take refuge in you rejoice. 
Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may exalt in you. For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover him with favor as with a shield. So for all those who repent from their sin, who take refuge in the Lord, they are to rejoice over his protection. It says it's like a, like a blanket. Spreading God spreads his blanket over us. Last night was kind of a cold night here in Chicago. Maybe the first cold night that we've had as we get ready for fall to approach. And yes, winter is coming. Winter is coming. How many of you put a blanket on last night and are wrapped up real snug like a bug in a rug, right? Imagine how wonderful on a cold night a warm blanket feels. And take that and multiply it infinitely. And that's what it is like to be wrapped up in the love of God, the protection of God, that sense of warmth, that sense of protection from the Lord. Also, his protection, his salvation is described as a shield in verse 12. It says, cover him with favor or compass him, surround him as with a shield. And so King David could probably picture his own armor bearer. When King David would go to battle, he would bear the sword, but he would probably have an armor bearer with a, a full body height and width armor uh, and shield that he would have to cover David, to keep him safe and to protect him. Or imagine if you were approaching an enemy city and the archers were there firing arrows and you took cover under a shield, and you heard the ping, ping, ping of the arrows hitting the shield above your head. That's the picture of God and his shielding protection over us from the flaming darts of the evil one and from the attacks of our accusers. This is the shield that God provides, and we can rejoice, we can sing, we can exalt. So as we conclude this morning, I want to tell you, and I saw that yawn over there, I want to tell you, that not all of us are morning people, are we? Not everybody is a morning person, but we can all be morning disciples. We can all be morning disciples. Even sleepyheads who hit the snooze button can be morning disciples of Jesus Christ. Through Jesus, seek an audience with the one true God. Through Jesus, lay your request before God and wait in watchful expectation. Through Jesus, trust in the righteous justice of God and rejoice in his merciful salvation. Amen? Amen. 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 Gracious Father in heaven, thank you for your word to us today. I love how uh, your word, uh, especially here in the Psalms, resonates with our feelings, resonate with our experience, whether it's tossing and turning in the watches of the night or whether it's awaking in the morning and dreading some of the things that may come before us that day. Lord, even if we're not mourning people by nature, we can be mourning disciples who cry out to you, who seek you first. May we seek you in the morning and step by step learn to walk in your way. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. And all God's people said,